everyone. Hello, welcome for another Holistic Creative Chat. And today's guest is somebody who is not too far from me in proximity right now. She's <laughs> sitting just a few miles north of here in, in our beloved Appalachian Mountains. This is Asia Suler, who of One Willow Apothecaries, right? Who is a writer and an herbalist, a gardener, an energy healer, um, a plant devotee, as you say, and really is um, inspired to bring the the medicine of the land, the medicine of the plants um, to people and a different way of looking at healing. And so Asia is, of course, one of our Spectrum contributors this year. I'm super happy to have her bringing a gorgeous workshop called Bedrock, Developing a Relationship with a Transformational Medicine of Land this year. And Asia, thank you for being here today to chat with us. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Haley, for having me. Yeah. So... I want to start with, um, there's a couple questions I ask everybody, and, and I kind of come at them a little bit different for each person. Um, I just want to ask you, when I say, you know, what does your creative practice look like right now? What does that bring up for you? You know, you're, you're different. We have a lot of painters and things that come on, or, or, you know, writers, but you're somebody who's really interacting with the land on a regular basis as an entrepreneur and as the way you yeah. live and navigate your life. So what does creative practice look like for you, Asia? Yeah, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but that's something that's always evolving for me and something that I'm sort of constantly coming to different realizations around. And, you know, starting a business is not easy for anyone. And I feel like for the first few years of my business, um, I was just so focused on crossing things off the to-do list, getting things done, you know, building this ship, basically. And I, I've had a real realization, you know, in the past year or so of just how important it is to leave yourself that time for creativity. And for me, I, I really am more of a beer than a doer, even though I feel like I've, I've really put on the, the doer trousers <laughs> in like the past, you know, I don't even know how long. Um, but so for me, like my creative process really looks like giving myself time and space to just be like sitting at the table. And I like to write down my dreams every morning. That's a really big and important practice for me to connect into sort of like my deeper intuition and that sort of really subconscious creative flow. But, you know, writing down my dreams and then literally just sitting there with a cup of tea for like 20 minutes and looking out the window, um, getting outside every day. And this to me is, is so vital and important, I think, because when I'm inside a lot, I get really inside my own head and that can be really productive and I can sort of think through and analyze a lot of things. But then the other side of that is that I can sort of get too much in that brain track. And for me, my greatest inspirations really come when I when I leave myself that kind of wide open space for newness to come in. So when I am outside, when I can be out in the woods or even just out for a walk down my road, it's like I, I clear away the, those tracks, those ruts that I get so used mm -hmm. to traveling on and sort of, you know, really open myself up the way in which kind of like the, the sun hits the earth and the flowers start to open in this, this new and exciting way. It's like there are aspects of my thought process and my creative heart that just open come in a completely different way. So for me, yeah, getting outside, going for walks, being active in that kind of way, and then really just like taking time to sit. And in the workshop that I developed for Spectrum, um, one of the basically practices for connecting that I have in there is to have a sit spot. And and for me, when I go hiking, like sometimes when I go hiking with friends, they're like, they get kind of annoyed with me because I'm, I'm constantly wanting to just stop and like sit in one place and just really <laughs> totally absorb it. Um, but for me, like that stillness is just a really inherent part of my um, ability to connect into my creative flow. Oh, I love that you said that. And we should go hiking together because I'm so the same way. <laughs> and, and it's, and yeah, you've really hit on some very important things, I think, to creative process in general that we often overlook that kind of downtime. Even like, even they're like, there's a level of zoning out that is truly an essential part of the creative process that we don't always associate with it because we're not doing, as you say, you know, we often want to see them the movement or the action or the result or the outcome or the product with our creative energy. But it is so crucial to have that kind of percolating time and that time when you're not really generating as much as the inspiration is kind of coming and moving through you and you're realizing your connection to it. And 
nature is 100% my go-to for that as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me it's like this difference between the um, creative output that comes from my sort of my conscious mind and my physical being, which can be really beautiful, and the creative input that comes from my wider self, what I like to term my wider self, my, my wider intuition, that, that sort of mythical, mystical part of me. And that is really where like the deepest and most like richest creative gems really come from for me. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. So what do you find, um, because I think being an entrepreneur adds, uh, you know, having your own creative business, because I consider what you do a creative business. I think being in business has to be creative, you know. <laughs> Definitely, I agree. And, uh, what, what do you find are some, um, well, you've already mentioned a few, but let's just hit it anyway, some obstacles or themes that come up for you when you look at like being an entrepreneur with a creative business? Yeah, there's tons. <laughs> um, no, it's just, you know, it's part of the process. I feel like business is such a reflection. Like it's this mirror for you, especially if you are, you know, you're a small business owner, you're an entrepreneur, you're sort of out there doing it on your own. You're having a lot reflected back to you all the time. And it's sort of like this like sacred workshop, I think. Um, so there's definitely that piece of the to-do list. That's a big deal for mm-hmm. me because I'm, I'm such a to-do list kind of person. And I'm, I'm always wanting to make sure I'm on top of everything and like taking care of everything that needs to get done. And that's really important. But then, yeah, you can have that time where you're actually not doing what, what is most fulfilling to you and what, why you got into the business in the first place. And, um, so I, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease last Mm -hmm. fall, and um, when the diagnosis happened, I was just coming back from a pretty long trip. I had been harvesting wild rice and teaching at different events across the country, and I was feeling so reinvigorated and just reconnected to my path and what I wanted the, the business to look like and how I wanted to structure my time, which really looked like having more free time for creativity. And I got back and I immediately started saying yes to all these mm-hmm. different things and um, saw myself again, like immediately getting back into this whole just sort of uh, circle of doing, doing, doing. And that's when I got hit with the Lyme and I ended up getting diagnosed. And the biggest thing that I've learned throughout this journey, and I've been pretty much symptom free since last April, mm-hmm. um, which is, is pretty incredible. Um, and of course I, you know, I was on antibiotics. I had a whole herbal regimen. I had a, a lot of stuff that I was doing, but really to me, the biggest lesson in the Lyme. And I think the reason why I had that experience, cause I think everything is meaningful and important mm-hmm. is to learn to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like such a luxury, but it's, it's really super vital. Like if you allow yourself that free time every morning um, to say go for your walk or you know have your tea or write a poem then you know you will have that time later in the day where you want to do your taxes where you want to balance your books Um, I sort of had this fear for a long time that if I didn't get those details done that um, I would never do them and I would somehow fail but the reality is that when I let myself do what I want to do exactly when I want to do it if the business, you know, is in line with what I actually am wanting to do on a soul level, then there are times where I, I will want to do that stuff that's that really is maybe dragging me down in that exact moment. So that's a really big one for me. And then the other one that I always like to mention, because I feel like it's not talked about enough, but is this idea of comparison mm-hmm. that like, and I forget who said it, but it's a quote basically like comparison kills joy or like mm-hmm. comparison is the death of joy. And, you know, I really feel like that's true that mm-hmm. when we compare ourselves or our business to other people, other artists, other entrepreneurs, um, it like kills our creative spark and, and spirit. And I think it's super common that we all do that in some way, shape or form, sure. but to always come back to and recognize that like what you have to give is so incredibly unique and precious and important and that we can actually just celebrate each other um, for the beautiful, amazing gifts that we're giving out into the world and to um, recognize that you don't, what you have to do doesn't have to look like anyone else. It doesn't have to be received the the same way to how anyone else's stuff is being received. That um, the most important thing is that you you really do you and you really, you know, put your fullest gifts out there. Um, and I was listening to this, um, 
business coach recently, Marie Forleo, mm -hmm. who's just great. And yeah. she's talking about, um, she was interviewing this woman, um, Sally Hogshead about this ability to fascinate, but she was talking about the fact that, you know, there's a lot of vanilla out there and like you can be vanilla, but really if you're a small business or a small artist, um, how important it is to like be pistachio ice cream, like <laughs> to just totally be you. And it's, and it's not something everyone's going to love and your audience is going to look different from someone else's audience, but that the people who love pistachio, like go out of their way yeah. to get pistachio. They're totally devoted to it. Um, and I feel that way with certain artists and entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. businesses that I love. So to really just like, you know, honor and recognize that pistachio in you. Yeah. I love, I love that. I love that metaphor too. And immediately coming to mind now, she's a little bit bigger on the pistachio end of things now, but as Amanda Palmer, I mean, you know, her <laughs> mm -hmm. audience is incredibly targeted toward her, you know, yeah. and it's not everybody's cup of tea, but, but that's, yeah, such a beautiful point. And, and that comparison thing, whether it's business or not, I think, you know, creative types, um, you know, artists face that all the time, even in creating their, their own pages, their own paintings, their oh, whatever, yeah. you know, um, we sometimes look to other people's work for inspiration, but there's, we have to be super self-aware about when we're crossing that line between receiving inspiration and then going into that territory where the joy is just being stomped out. And, mm -hmm. and we're starting to then get, um, you know, tough on ourselves in a way that's not helpful to being our true selves. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think everything you just said to me personally, it's so in line with my personal, like my values about things like this is what's going to heal the world. If everybody could just like show up and just embrace who they are and be that and trust that we're all here to offer something and we're yes. all here to receive something. And we can do that most fully when we're being fully ourselves. So I completely agree. Okay, so I'm going to ask you something I don't, I've never asked anybody else to. Okay. You're the perfect person for it. But, and it'll lead us into the question I ask everybody. Um, <laughs> but um, how, tell me how you define holistic. Hmm. Yeah, so for me, holistic means looking at, recognizing, valuing, appreciating, speaking to the whole. And, you know, different people might define the whole differently. But to me, the whole includes body, mind, spirit, it includes the me that is walking around and wakes up every morning and, you know, has my cup of tea. And also the me that is this more mythic me, the, this wider me, the me that sort of is the dream time self, the me that can cycle through my days in this wider way and see the bigger picture you know I the me that um, holds those grains of intuition and wisdom and um, so for me holistic healing is is really about like bringing those those selves together mm -hmm. um, is about recognizing that they're a whole and by seeing myself as um, an aspect of this this wider light and I, I like to use this um, metaphor of a, a sun catcher in a window. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone's ever seen one of those, is the sort of prism crystals and how, you know, when the light comes in just right, um, you get this refraction of the light and just this spectrum of rainbows on the, the walls. And to me, you know, our widest selves, our biggest, truer selves is that sunlight, you know, just mm -hmm. like vast and totally regenerative and like eternal in this kind of way. Um, and then our embodied selves is literally like that one ray of that light that comes, travels down to the earth, travels down to that house, travels through that specific window pane into that specific crystal, which you might think of as our actual like crystalline bodies, like the bodies that we're in. And that if we are able to see and recognize and heal that whole, see that, okay, like I am in this body and I can sort of support and cleanse and heal this body. Um, and by doing that, open up even more to reflecting, refracting and receiving that light of my greater self. That's when like the rainbows happen, right? That's mm -hmm. like when our greatest gifts can really be given. So to me, um, holism is that aspect literally of like seeing and, and recognizing and, and courting that whole. Mm -hmm. mm, so beautiful. Oh my goodness. And that, that, yeah, <laughs> it's the full spectrum of us. It's, it's really essentially that metaphor itself is why that spectrum word is what I chose for, for the workshop a couple years Love ago. It. And uh, yeah, mm, thank you. So mm -hmm. the question I do ask everybody is how do you define healing today? 
Yeah. So that's such a, that (laughs) is such a big topic because I think in the past when we were part of cultures or societies that were a little bit more whole, right? Like they had sort of cohesive, um, philosophy, like regenerative earth systems. Um, the aspect of healing that was most important was sort of healing the body, um, healing the community, healing also on the spiritual level. But now I feel like um, we live in a really interesting time where there's not that much holism in our communities and our relationship to the earth. And so healing now, the kind of healing that has to happen is like happening on all these levels. And I really believe that what we experience in our physical bodies, whether it's chronic or acute, you know, illness or injury, um, I I believe that it is a gift and that it always is this portal to recognizing or seeing what it is we need to rebalance in our lives. And that might come on a very personal level, you know, like I'm not taking enough time to rest and that's why I got the flu. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it might come on this, this, you know, wider, more like community or earth scale, you know, like I'm, I am, I have difficulty, you know, concentrating in on things. I have some aspects of ADHD, like I need to be outside and interacting. And that's part of, you know, my healing process of sort of like being able to um, step more fully into the sort of concentration that I know that I could have, for example. So Mm -hmm. for me, healing is again, back to this ideal of of holism. I don't think healing happens unless you are looking at the whole. And to me, this sort of body signals that we get um, and that that could be again like acute. It could be anxiety. It could be depression. Um, these are signals that we're getting to look at an issue that is affecting us on this in this greater whole. And I think when we can um, sort of open our hearts and open our consciousness to seeing that in a wider way, and even even putting the intention out there, like okay, like I want to see this, or you know, I, I'm willing to work with this. That um, that's when true healing really happens. And I think you know, when, when we aren't willing to look at the whole like that, we might have specific, uh, aspects heal, you know, Mm -hmm. like we, we might Mm -hmm. have sprained our Mm -hmm. ankle and that might heal, but Mm -hmm. it'll manifest itself in a different way. So true healing to me is, is yeah, being open to, um, exploring that whole and finding balance in that holistic kind of way. Absolutely. I, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Looking at that wholeness view. Gosh, Mm -hmm. Asia, thank you. Everything you have said is so rich and so spot on, I feel. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. (laughs) Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. 